All right, so uh, next up we have Stuart Haber. Uh, he's been a cryptographer and researcher at HP and is the chief scientist at Audit Chain. And of course, you know, even more relevant to our expo, he has three citations in the Satoshi White Paper and has many innovations in digital timestamping. And he's here to share his perspective um, on the history and foundation of blockchain. So let's please give it up for uh, Stuart before he comes on. Okay, so I'm going to tell um, um, something about the origin of the blockchain, and I will uh, warn you something about its foundations. Now, um, in an audience like this, I'll bet almost everybody has, uh, almost everybody here has had the occasion to uh, be challenged to tell a lay audience that is not in this bubble of paying attention to um, cryptocurrencies about what this crazy Bitcoin blockchain nonsense is um, and, and make it understood. Uh, I had the occasion, occasion to do that a couple of months ago at a TEDx talk um, where I tried, among other things, to actually explain how blockchain works without lying, but only in um, um, a couple minutes. So I'm going to spend the first part of this talk actually uh, running that by you and ask for uh, feedback. What did I leave out? What did I lie about, maybe? Um, uh, what, what point did I try and did, um, would have sailed over the head of a, of a lay audience? And so on. What did I say too much about? And then um, I, I'll solicit feed, feedback from you about that. And then I'll um, get, to, get to my warning about the possible shakiness of cryptographic foundations. So, pretend you're, um, you're the only, you sitting there are the only expert who, in, in, in a huge hall of people who don't know much about um, uh, this blockchain Bitcoin bubble. So, um, remember, we're not here, we're somewhere else. Um, Everybody here, almost everybody here, has at least heard of this magical currency called Bitcoin. Maybe not all of you have heard of something called blockchain, which is one of the important pieces of, of, um, of Bitcoin. As I'll explain, decentralization is central to the appeal of blockchain and, um, and of Bitcoin. In fact, in the way I'm going to tell this story, I'm at the center of the story, since I was present at the creation of the blockchain. Along with a colleague, I wrote the first uh, papers that amounted to the invention of the blockchain. So let's go to the beginning of the story. It's the fall of 1989, and I was a researcher at Bellcore, Bell Communications Research, the um, the Bell Labs of the local phone companies, which was uh, brand new, or almost brand new at the time. Um, uh, I was a researcher in cryptography, the science and engineering of protecting information, keeping it secret if it should be secret, and making sure it doesn't change if it shouldn't change. Uh, I was, I was, uh, I'd been there two, a couple years. A new guy came in, his name was Scott Sternetta, and he came to me and proposed that we tackle the problem of how to securely timestamp digital documents. And in fact, that's the, uh, when we did solve the problem, or came up with a reasonable solution, that was the title of our paper, which appeared in um, 1990 at the conference called Crypto, the main the, uh, the most prestigious conference in the field of, of, of cryptography. So by digital document, we meant, we, of course, here I'll just say it, it's a bit string, anything, any, any, uh, any string of bits at all representing um, uh, business records, uh, lab notebook, um, financial transaction, and so on. Um, and all of these files are easy to modify. Even in 1989, 
or back in 1989, it was, it was clear that all of the world's records were moving online. In 1989, it wasn't, um, it um, hadn't exactly happened yet, but it was clearly uh, moving in that direction. Available crypt cryptographic techniques pointed to a straightforward solution to the problem of time stamping digital documents. I'll, I'll, I'll jump away from the general audience and just say hash and sign time stamping. Um, uh, that solution uses a single trusted entity to um, certify the authenticity of strings of bits. That corresponds in the real world to trusting your, your marriage license to City Hall, your uh, driver's license to the uh, cursed Department of Motor Vehicles, or, the, um, or a bank for the uh, balance of your, of your checking account. But this solution was unsatisfactory to Sternetta and me because a single a central entity is what security people call a single point of failure, one that could be bribed, corrupted, or hacked. Could we do better? Yes, we could. So here's my uh, three or four minute animation of how the blockchain actually works. So, so I'll start with a, with a metaphor. There is, as it were, a way to take the fingerprint of any, any digital file, any record. That's a good metaphor because the fingerprint of a file is small, no matter what the size of the, of the file. It gives no information about the file, just like my fingerprint gives you no information about how tall I am, the color of my hair, whether I have any hair. The fingerprint is characteristic of the file. If you take several identical, identical copies of the same file and take, take the fingerprint of each copy, you get identical fingerprints. And most important of all, the fingerprint is unique to the file. Here's where I'm lying, of course. Um, um, uh, the, but I'll get to that. Um, if you take two different files, no matter, no matter what they are, even if they're the same file except for one single bit, their fingerprints differ wildly and unpredictably. So now I'll show you how Stornetta and I turned this um, fingerprinting process into a solution to the time stamping problem that we posed ourselves and built a, a blockchain. In fact, our solution to this was spun out of um, Belcor as a, um, as a company to commercialize our time stamping um, process. So here's how it worked. We would get um, time stamping requests from customers consisting of the fingerprints of the, respect of, of, of the records they wanted to register with us. We would group these requests into units that now I'll call blocks. We would take the, the, the requests into a, in a block and boil them down into a single fingerprint that encapsulated all of the um, records in the block, un, un, resulting in a single fingerprint that can be unforgeably linked to each of the records in the block. Records keep, uh, keep, keep coming in. We do the same thing to a second block, boil it down to a, um, a single fingerprint, but link it to the previous block, and so on, a third block, a fourth block. And then every so often, for example, once a week, we would take the entire week's worth of records and boil them down to a single summarizing fingerprint that um, encapsulates the entire week of transactions and because of the linking, the entire history of the transactions um, up to that moment. Now, this was commercially deployed already in 1995. How did, and this was, we were a single time stamping entity, how did we guarantee worldwide consensus on the uh, value of that fingerprint? We, we wanted to make that fingerprint a widely witnessed 
widely witnessable, widely verifiable event. And the uh, internet community in 1995 was rather smaller than it is now. And um, there, were, there were many fewer people actually interested in guaranteeing integrity of, of records. So what we did was we put that fingerprint in an advertisement in the national edition of the Sunday New York Times once a week, every week. Now that, um, that process, that daily, weekly placement of an ad in the New York Times continues to this very day. Here I am standing at um, last summer's crypto conference holding the most recent New York Times. Uh, let's zoom in on, the, uh, on that. There is, um, there is an ad in the New York Times that uh, uh, has a hash value, a number, every bit of which depends on every bit of all the timestamping requests received by Surety, as our um, company was called, since it was deployed in 1995. Here, here is the New York Times as delivered to my apartment in New York. Um, This, if you're old enough, this is called the subway fold. <laughs> There's the ad uh, from last Sunday. Go out and buy, buy, the, uh, buy the Times uh, today and you can see um, today's. I want this back. <laughs> All right, so um, let's, now, now the story jumps ahead uh, a few years. Uh, the, um, you know, it was just a, just a couple months ago, well, Three or four months ago, we celebrated the 10-year anniversary of the appearance of Bitcoin with, um, with this uh, wonderful paper by uh, um, a cryptographer, economist, um, writer, code writer named Satoshi Nakamoto, whoever he is, she was, they were. Now, um, that uh, completely does away with the central and centralizing role of banks. Now, as in any financial system, Satoshi needed a way to um, guarantee the integrity of the transactions in the system. That is, to make sure that if I promise you 17 Bitcoin, you um, can't turn around and change that into a promise that I send you 1,700 Bitcoin or 17 Bitcoin cents or millionths of a cent. In order to do that, Satoshi used the timestamping system, the data structure, the blockchain, though Satoshi didn't call it a blockchain, uh, which, which I just explained to you. There's the, um, the three, uh, three of the eight references in there, one of which is just a, a um, completely standard textbook, a good one uh, for, for, for probability and, and, and statistics. Now, um, banks are not the only central, centralizing institutions whose um, records we depend on for various things. By now, of course, as every uh, blockchain, the blockchain data structure has been suggested for record keeping projects of all kinds, some of them foolish, some of them worthwhile. I'll, I'll just give a couple of examples. This is a project for giving, um, supplying a digital identity to anybody who wants one, particularly directed at the more than one billion people on the planet who um, can't depend on um, a national ID because of uh, political chaos or, um, or a natural disaster. Or Worse, both happening simultaneously in the same place. Um, uh, another kind of record is the uh, pile of records go that go with the global supply chain for um, uh, shipping um, objects, physical things from one place to another. Uh, contents of containers, uh, customs um, certification, and so on. IBM, same. One small company has a big, uh, big project about that. But it's not only humongous shipping containers and big companies. Um, do you wonder about the source of the fish you 
had for um, dinner. Maybe you can uh, soon, or there are projects here for doing this uh, kind of thing. Soon you'll be able to sort, um, trace um, that fish all the, from its source all the way to your plate. Uh, circling back to the uh, to the beginning, there I've, I've spent some uh, some time recently working on a project to give uh, cryptographic verifiability to um, regular reporting of business records. So, um, lo these many years later, turns out that asking a pointed question about decentralizing the guarantees of integrity of digital records can upend all sorts of central institutions. I'm excited. All right, end of TED talk. Now, now, well, um, now it's a TEDx talk. Um, let's, um, let's get a little more technical. What, this, what about this fingerprinting process? So here's a more formal definition of the, of the um, properties that I uh, ex explained um, metaphorically using uh, in terms of uh, fing fing <coughs> fingerprinting, um, when cryptographers, when theoretically minded cryptographers uh, give a talk about a system, they say, well, let H be a function in instantiated in code uh, that has these magical properties. Uh, this is a lot to ask for a function because um, the uh, what mathematicians of a, cer of a certain sort call the uh, pigeonhole principle assures you that um, there are lots and lots of pairs for any, any function whose argument, whose um, 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 compressing bit strings to fixed length bit strings, there are lots of collisions as they're called. That is, lots of pairs of documents, x and x prime, with the same hash value. So, do secure hash functions, that is hash functions with, the, with these magical properties, actually exist? And here I want to um, point out that knowledge in the field of cryptography is very different from knowledge in um, uh, certain other areas of science and engineering. We feel fairly, um, safe in this building, you all feel safe sitting right here knowing there are tons of uh, concrete and metal and who knows what else sitting above your head. Um, why, why is that? Because this building was built according to um, scientific and engineering principles that we know to be true. In cryptography, we don't know anything. The, uh, the, um, the, uh, the protocols and, uh, that secure your uh, payments, your communication, and so on, are based on assumptions that we do not know to be true. Uh, by the way, does anybody recognize the name William Goldman? You know why I, I wrote it down here? He's the, um, um, a great American um, screenwriter. Some people uh, um, call him the inventor of many of the conventions of uh, the way the movies work. In the movie making business, one of the, the most important questions is, is this story, is this um, outline of a story, is it gonna be a hit? Is it gonna make money? And within, um, within the movie business, Goldman, is who wrote many hit movies, but he's very famous for saying, nobody knows anything. And that's true about cryptographic assumptions. For example, the assumption that a certain um, algorithm instantiating a function called, for example, SHA-256, has those magical properties that I just uh, outlined. Well, what can you do if they don't exist? Well, don't give up entirely, um, in, because, in fact, at any given time, a secure hash function um, does exist, only temporar but temporarily. It's a fairly safe bet that right now, uh, nobody anywhere on the planet has two bit strings with the same SHA-256 um, 
hash value. I would have said, um, I more or less did say, and in fact built the system using SHA-1, which is an earlier standard hash function, um, a while ago. So attacks on hash functions get better. What's the right way to swap in a new hash function to a, an or, already running integrity system? So let's make the, here's a concrete puzzle. So suppose you um, created this document um, 10 years ago, and you, uh, let's see, if, if it was exactly 10 years ago, Bitcoin code was, was running somewhere, but um, uh, did anybody in this room actually uh, run Bitcoin exactly 10 years ago? Okay, but so um, my time stamping service was not exactly thriving, but running 10 years ago. Uh, the, um, uh, suppose you time stamped your document um, 10 years ago. Uh, and you got a time stamp certificate. And let's say the time stamping service used a particular hash function H. Now, attacks on, on uh, hash functions advance sort of um, incrementally. So um, let's say you, you hear that, um, that uh, NIST, uh, National Institute of Standards and Technology, has uh, a new hash function, um, which they um, have standardized. And maybe it's better, H prime. Uh, and your favorite timestamping service offers its timestamping service with H prime, if, you, if that's what you ask for. How can you use the new, uh, how can you use the timestamping service when instantiated with H prime in order to update or renew um, the guarantee of integrity provided by, by your 10 year old certificate? You wanna buttress the security for the proof of your important document from 10 years ago. What do you do? Suggestions? All right, so hold on. One thing you might do, so here, um, stating it again, you wanna update um, your old certificate. So uh, one thing you might do is submit the time, submit a timestamp request um, using H prime, using the new hash function, and uh, there you go. Well, that doesn't actually solve your problem. Your document's 10 years old, getting a certificate for, for this week is fine, but it's secure now, but uh, you've, you've completely lost any um, um, link to, uh, to, to its creation 10 years ago when you, uh, if, the, if the old hash function is attacked. So, I heard hash the hash. So something you might do is um, timestamp the old certificate using the new hash function right now. What's wrong with this? What's wrong, so in fact, in fact, that first, the, how to timestamp a digital document Sternetta and I proposed this solution in the paper, and we didn't realize um, that it's, it's got a dumb mistake in it. Went right, went, went right through the, um, the conference committee for crypto. It, the very, a few months later, it was in the Journal of Cryptology. Referees didn't notice this. Um, they didn't notice because people don't, weren't paying attention. People didn't really care. Oh, well, we didn't have a proof. But uh, what's wrong with this solution? Exactly. That's why you said to have to hash both, presumably. So uh, here's the problem. Remember, I want um, the way I stated this puzzle. You have this 10-year-old timestamp certificate. Um, you want to uh, keep the link to the old um, to to the creation time and the certification of that, uh, and not be screwed up by a completely devastating attack a few years from now. So the point, the point is, what if a, a devastating attack, that is one that can easily find, find collisions, the, um, uh, the only link 
between your document and this proposed updated solution, that is getting a certificate for the old certificate, is its hash value by the old hash function. So anybody who finds a collision, another an X prime that collides with your 10-year-old X a few years from now can claim with no, um, without, uh, without fear of being contradicted that the colliding document is certified in this way. So what you need to do is timestamp the concatenation yeah, of, the, uh, of the old certificate and the original and the document. You have to touch every bit again. Now you're, you, you are protected. There's, there's a slightly fishy assumption there, which is I'm, I'm assuming that, in fact, at the moment right now when I, when I do this proposed updating um, proposal, uh, nobody actually know, has a, uh, nobody knows anything about how to attack uh, hash function H. But this is um, a fishy assumption, but it's actually the best you can do. And it's not so fishy because, in fact, uh, the, um, I used to comfortably say this about this, um, the, uh, that um, attacks on hash functions uh, come bit by bit. They're sort of incremental attacks. So well before a, um, a completely devastating attack is um, known, uh, there's plenty of time to do this swap in a new hash function operation. Of course, when I started um, speaking that way, there were, not, there were, there were uh, no standing billions of dollars uh, worth of target um, that, to, uh, available for uh, hash function attacks. Um, but it still seems uh, reasonably plausible there, uh, that you can swap in a new hash function. So what's the right way to do this in a, um, in, in a system like Bitcoin? I'm not quite sure. Any questions? Uh, questions or comments on the uh, on the, um, the the lay summary in the first half of the talk? So I have a two-part question. Okay. Uh, number one, um, it's a great presentation, and um, did you communicate with Satoshi by email or any forms of communication? <laughs> what was that? Did you communicate with Satoshi by email or phone calls? <laughs> 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 um, uh, no, I'm not. No, no. And, uh, no, and, and no, I didn't. Did you buy any Bitcoin? <laughs> Tiny little. Not, um, not, uh, not enough to stop me asking for train fare to come here from New York. <laughs> <laughs> so you didn't even mine Bitcoin then? What? You didn't uh, even mine Bitcoin. Uh, no, I didn't. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I do, also, I did not mind mind uh, Bitcoin. <laughs> you know, I have to ask. Back when the internet was a super highway with a series of tubes, when you opened a, your service in 1991, how did people get fingerprints to you? Did they mail you floppies? Did they dial up bulletin boards? No, the system? the internet existed. Uh, you know, surety actually had a um, oh, had had a website uh, that was up and running when um, when um, uh, yeah, you know, the Wall, the Wall, the Wall Street Journal right? occasionally actually used the words "World Wide Web" um, in sequence. Uh, a gopher space? Uh, huh? Did you have a gopher space menu to upload the hashes? Um, so we had um, um, there was a, a web interface, but we also had local software that would compute the hashes and send them. Oh, and the um, and you got back a certificate. We we, we built new blocks, and uh, you got back a certificate in internet latency time. So it was internet then, huh? Oh yeah, oh. yes. 
I was, I was steward at surety.com. Uh, for your customers getting the digital timestamp, did you automatically upgrade them to the new hash function? Did you? Uh, yes. So yeah. the uh, oh, um, uh, a minor technical note: I was worried about um, hash function attacks already when this was uh, was what was deployed. So at first de de deployment, the um, our hash function H was. MD5 and SHA-1 used in parallel. That is, your, uh, your, your uh, time step request was the MD5 hash of your, of your document and followed by the SHA-1 hash of, of your document. And, if, and we built Merkle trees and so on um, and linked uh, the, our blocks using um, concatenation. And uh, the fall of 2000, Four, I forget, four or five. Um, uh, when did when when were the uh, when was the attack on MD5 shown in the rump session at Crypto 2004? I think so. That fall, we um, we switched to SHA2, SHA256, concatenated with uh, RIPE MD160, uh, European standard hash function, which um, um, it's only 160 bits long, but the seems quite strong still now. Um, okay, so you've obviously been in computer science for a long time and have a great deal of experience. And I'm really curious to hear from you. We always hear the comparison of um, the early tech dot-com boom to what is happening right now in cryptocurrency. And I'm curious to hear from you as you watch the technology that you worked on evolve. What do you think is a comparison or lesson from previous technological uh, I guess periods of innovation in terms that we don't usually hear about other than you know prices or the way that uh, funds are raised the way that the technology itself is applied do you think that there's any comparisons that you're noticing in terms of the evolution of the tech? Uh, well first as I said and um, plenty of foolish examples being being proposed uh, uh, um, but um, it's hard um, uh, one um, one way of talking about it that I like, I believe Amber actually used uh, used this phrase uh, in her talk at the end of proceedings uh, yesterday. Uh, uh, history may not repeat itself, but it rhymes. It, so that's a clever way of, of ducking your question entirely, <laughs> which I hereby do. <laughs> <laughs> 